Hello number ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Now, when I was a university student, one of my majors was ancient Japanese history, together with the study of the language, of course. Now, I don't really know why it took me so long to make an actual video about Japanese history, uh, but the thing is that the reason why I made this video is because I was on Facebook the other day, or a couple of weeks ago now, and I was asked a question, the question being, why didn't the Japanese use shields on the battlefield? So, let's answer it. Okay, so I think the best way to answer the question why didn't the Japanese use shields on the battlefield is to say that they actually did. The Japanese used shields on the battlefield. And in this video I will point out three types of shields that the Japanese used. But before discussing these shields and actually proving to you and bringing up some historical points, I would like to discuss about this common concept and idea of the Japanese not using shields in battle. I think the main problem here comes from the idea of ancient Japanese history only having to do with samurai history. Now, samurai history is one thing, it's a portion of ancient Japanese history and warfare. As a matter of fact, we can consider, roughly speaking, 10th century to the 17th. But there is much more, and there are a lot of things that happened before that, but most people don't really consider and talk about uh, what happened before the rise of the samurai. Now, of course, the samurai were a very important um, figure of Japanese warfare, but before, um, we have other two periods that are very important and most, most of the times people don't even talk about, and the, the, these are the Jomon period, or Jomon Jidai, and the Yayoi period, or Yayoi Jidai. Now, during these periods here, handheld shields were very popular and they were used by Japanese infantry. Now let me show you some examples. This is the kind of shields that we're talking about, so you can kind of picture it in your mind. And um, here are some people reenacting uh, these errors. Now, of course, even for reenactment, it's not very popular because, again, the figure of the samurai is much more popular. So most people tend to reenact that, including myself. But um, it did exist, and sometimes they reenact this in Japan. So the real question is, why did the Japanese stop using handheld shields on the battlefield? This is the actual correct, historically correct question that should be asked by someone who knows about Japanese history. There are two dates in Japanese history that are very important because they changed completely the way of making war of ancient Japanese warring clans. The 5th century and the 15th century. The 15th century is very famous because there is the introduction of a specialized, of a very special weapon, the Tanegashima Teppo, or much type arquebus, which was copied from the Portuguese. So this is something that the Portuguese, so European, introduced in Japan. And these were mass-produced to the point that in Japan there were more match lock type arquebus than in the rest of Europe at one point. Please keep in mind that these were also used by samurai as much as uh, ashigaru or foot soldiers. So what about the 5th century? The 5th century is the date of the introduction of the horse in Japan. And this is what really changed completely the situation, because you have to consider that Japan was constantly in war, at war. But not exactly for the entirety, there were some periods of peace, but most of the times so the Japanese were fighting against each other for a very simple reason. There was a lack of resources and, and land that could be used for farming and production of resources. Because most of the time, some people, some historians, they say that only 20% of Japanese land could be used for resource production. So what that means is that the battle and, and the wars between the Japanese were not only battles and wars for supremacy, but also for survival. Now, in the 5th century, we have the introduction of the horse, as I mentioned, and what meant that we have the introduction of cavalry unit. And cavalry proved superior to um, infantry soldiers and foot soldiers holding the shield. So, in that, at that point, the Japanese had to make a choice. Either we try to evolve our uh, infantry and shield-holding soldiers to a more effective version that can actually fight against cavalry, or we implement cavalry ourselves. And this is what they did. So, it's a choice. 
abandon the handheld shield and start developing cavalry, which will then lead to the figure of the samurai, which were born as cavalry forces, although towards the end of their history, the samurai really become more foot soldiers, or we could say both. Now, this is when the handheld shield is dropped and is not used anymore, but that doesn't mean the shields were not used anymore. Even in the, during the very popular samurai era, we have the usage of tate. Now, tate are stationary, stationary shields, very similar to the Italian pavese used by crossbowmen from Genova. And they were used to protect um, either archers or subsequently gunmen from enemy fire. So again, it's not a handheld shield, but it is indeed a shield. So the Japanese did use it. But the third kind of shield that the Japanese never really stopped using, and this might sound a little odd, but it's the sode, the pauldron. So in other words, this. Now this is my uh, 16th century um, sode or pauldron coming from my 16th century Tose Kusoku armor. Um, so of course it will be smaller than previous versions, but if you look at this, as you can see, it's quite flat. And the purpose of this was to protect you from arrows, mostly. So, although the 16th version might not look as obvious, please have a look at the earliest examples for the, for the ancient Yoroi uh, or Oyoroi styles of armor. As you can tell, um, we are talking about an actual shield, two shields, and they were used differently. They were even um, fastened in a different way. As you can see here, we've got goggles used to fasten it on top of the armor, but that's because um, you have to consider that in the 16th century, the armor was supposed to, to confront and protect you from gunfire, from, so basically bows shot by the Tanegashima Teppo, the matchlock type arquebus. But in ancient times, what they needed to do is to protect you from arrows. So this is why the sode were a lot bigger, were, looked much more like a square, so much more similar to actual, to actual shields, and they were not fastened to the armor, but they were hung with cords, so it would be a lot easier to remove them if you needed to do so. So the question here is, why choosing to wear two smaller shields rather than holding one in your hand and use your, your weapon, your primary weapon, with the other hand? Now I've read some forums about this and I noticed that there are again misconceptions going around. A lot of people say because shields are clumsy and cumbersome. No, that's not the case. Also, because you have to consider that the term shield is a, an umbrella term. A scutum, Roman scutum, is a shield, just as much as a buckler is a shield. This is also a shield. A Norman kite shield is a shield. A heater shield is a shield. A pavese is a shield. So you can see the enormous difference between a pavese or a scutum and a buckler. Now, I will grant you that perhaps a scutum is not the most agile implement for defense, and, but although it did work very well with the Romans for a thousand years, I don't think that they would have used something so clumsy as you might think. Um, but a Viking shield, for example, and a buckler can be used very effectively, and they can be very nimble in the hand, so much so that you can use them for both attack and defense. So a somewhat smaller shield to the size of a heater shield or a viking shield could have easily been used also by the samurai or something similar to what they were using before the rise of cavalry. And, uh, and that would have not meant uh, becoming clumsy at all. So again, why did they not do that? Well again, other people answered because the Japanese prefer uh, two-handed weapons. For example, yari, naginata, katana, tachi and, um, and even the bow. Well, it has to do with their weapon usage, but not really to the extent of simply preferring two-handed weapons. But it's again because the main weapon of samurai was the bow and then pole arms. But let's focus on the bow for a second, the yumi. So differently from a European knight, the samurai was also an archer. So differently from swords and spears, the bow is the only weapon that you cannot use if you're holding a shield. Okay, and I think that this is precisely the reason why they don't hold um, shields in their hands. Because a katana, yes, it's well, tachi, although it's a secondary weapon, even thirdary weapon, it's not really a main weapon on the battlefield, but yeah, they were using them. You can still use it one-handed if you want to. Um, they don't, but you can technically do it. And that's the same for the, for the spear, 
just look at Hellenistic warfare, they used the phalanx, which is basically shield and spear formation. So the Japanese could have also done that. So I think it all has to do with the fact that the bow is the only weapon that you can't use together with a shield. So it was a choice. Either we use a shield and our other weapons one-handed, or we use a bow. Now, if you use a bow, and that's obviously what the Japanese chose, even the, the samurai armor, as I've said, is, is done in a way that you can use a bow effectively wearing it. Considering the fact that they needed to use the bow, they chose to have the shields here. Now, since they are not carrying a shield, then they start using all the other weapons uh, two-handed. This is my opinion. It's kind of backward. Um, it's not that they prefer to use their, their weapons two-handed, it's just that since they had to renounce the shield anyways, then they might as well use them two-handed, because honestly, I myself prefer using a spear or a sword uh, two-handed unless I am using a shield. If I'm using a shield, I can use a you know, sword and shield combo, but if I only have one-handed sword, even if it's an arming sword like the one I have, I'm still going to grab grip the pommel and use it two-handed. I myself prefer it for leverage reasons and many others. If it was a maybe a cavalry saber, you know, English cavalry saber, then yes, you can use that with one hand, but it's a completely different context. Ultimately, the last thing, last point I'd like to bring up is Japanese armor. They used an, their armor a lot. They trusted their armor a lot to be their main protection. Differently from example for the Romans, that main protection for a Roman is the shield. And secondly, the lorica he's wearing. Okay, so here I am in full samurai armor, 16th century tall saber sword. So as I was saying, um, the armor is designed so that you could use both a hand-to-hand uh, -hand weapon, a spear, a sword, but mainly a bow. So you can see that this is as much mobility I have for the arms, and this is as far as uh, I can go back, okay? And considering Japanese archery, try again. Okay, so already like this, I have total mobility. In the case of Ashigaru, but also some samurai, when I was using, when well, they were using a spear, okay, so I'm going to charge, to charge you in. What the Japanese did, they would shoot arrows. Now, please consider that the draw weight of Japanese bows wasn't as strong as, for example, English long bows. So a Japanese arrow would not be able to penetrate the samurai armor and even armor from Ashigaru. So what they basically did was they were hoping to get into the gaps. Now there are gaps, as you can see there is a gap here and a gap here because of the uh, range of motion that I have to make sure to have. So what the Japanese did is that when they charged in during what the Japanese called the armor testing, which is how they called the first uh, round, shall we say, of, of arrows that they shot, um, they would charge in like this. This way, I am not offering my weak spots to the enemy, I'm only offering my pauldrons, my helmet, my door. In the very moment of charging, considering there could still be arrows coming towards me, and obviously points of Yari, what they did is, although this might sound strange, the best area and strongest part of their armor is here. So the way they charged in was like this. So they wouldn't really look they would just look down and hope for the best, although we have to consider that this is something that you would do at the very last moment. So, charging in like this. It, this shouldn't surprise us though, because it's something that we did uh, similar, there was something very similar we did in doing jousting, for example, the medieval knights wearing the frogmouth helmet, considering that the strongest part of the frogmouth helmet is this part here, because it's one solid plate, uh, hence, and that's because it was developed specifically for jousting, it didn't have hinging methods of any kind. What they did to maximize protection, knights, just before impact, they would do this movement like this, they would go back with their head, so that even if there were little fragments of lance uh, flying around, they wouldn't be able to enter inside your visor through the actual eye slits. So this is what they would do just before impact. Similar technique, I would say. It's just the Japanese would look down. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. Before finishing the video, um, there is one YouTuber that I would like to mention, and his name is Kyartan the Viking. Um, 
he has recently mentioned me, and he even in one in his latest videos and uh, in his latest video, and he also um, used a few clips from one of my videos where I um, show some combat moves from The Witcher. And I always appreciate that. I, I really appreciate when other YouTubers mention me, or even if they use little clips from my videos. I always return the favor as much as I can. So this is what I'm doing here. Um, he has made this video about The Witcher. You can find the link in the description. So, if you want, if you're interested in his examination of the Witcher style of fighting, which I myself will make a video like this in the future. But if you're interested and you want to see how he used my clip or, and how he talks about this, please go check him out. Okay then, thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings.